Yeah. No, is it on? No. Yes. Yeah. Ah, it's on. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this symposium is about uh, island paleontology, the island life before man. So, and it's my great pleasure to introduce the first speaker for this particular session. Uh, this is Alexandra van der Geer, and she comes all the way from uh, Naturalis in Holland, and she'll be talking about life, uh, island life before man. Is this, uh, yeah, this is working, okay. Okay, I find it very interesting to see how life on islands was before uh, we changed the planet and the biodiversity on it. That's why I'm interested in paleontology. Moment, I have to learn this, uh, uh, yeah. Okay, uh, ever since uh, Wallace and Darwin, uh, island species have fascinated naturalists all over the world. But from time to time, also the media gets interested, and via the media, the general public. And this year, the attention window was on the Philippines, where yet another new species of hominid was found. And what attracted the media most was the small body size of this new human. Uh, but for more than a century, uh, naturalists and evolutionary biologists are aware of a body size pattern on islands, and I call it the island rule. Most of you are already acquainted with this. According to its large size taxa evolve dwarf size and dwarf size small size taxa evolve giant size and they both converge and on the intermediate size. And here you see a typical example for the, this is the late Pleistocene of Flores and on island founders of the past, you typically see a dwarf megaher before, here is Stegodon. You see a dwarfed giant reptile, here the Komodo dragon. You see a giant mouse, or rat. And you see, and this is uh, hotly debated, a small bodied uh, human. And this is about half or one third of the size of its ancestor. That depends on who you follow for ancestry, the Manisi form or Java form. Uh, but uh, not everybody follows this. There are people who think that this is a, a primitive small body, body relict of elsewhere, so no island rule involved there. But according to us, um, why, why wouldn't humans follow the island rule so, uh, as all mammals do? Uh, to see the pervasiveness of this pattern, we studied uh, 63 species of extinct mammals uh, over the world um, from different orders to see if there's any relation with the geographical and ecological characteristics of the islands and the species thereon. And what we found, it was predictable of course, but we found this a mini megafauna and a mega mini fauna. And now we want to know, of course, what is the extreme? What is the most mini the megafauna can be? And we have here the late Pleistocene of Cyprus, island in the Mediterranean Sea, uh, where an the hippo there, the hippopotamus minor, evolved uh, dwarf size, became as small as a pig, which is just 130 kilograms. So that is about 4% of its uh, ancestor. The ancestor was larger than the hippopotamus of today, the Pleistocene hippo. And this is how that looks when you go to the collection. You don't see uh, real hippos in the field, of course, they are extinct. But if you go to the collection, and this is what you see. You see the molars compared to a, a, a mainland form. It's hugely different yet still a hippo. But that's not the extreme. When you go to elephants, in the middle Pleistocene of Sicily, you had a dwarf elephant that evolved a small body size up to, uh, down to 2% of its ancestral body size. So that would look something like this. This elephant is just uh, one meter tall, would make a nice pet. And if you see the, the mole, uh, I have uh, a cast of molars of another dwarf elephant that reduced to something like 10%, something five times, five times larger than the size of this dwarf elephant. And they're just still this small. So you can later come and look how these molars of a dwarf elephant look like. Five times the size of the smallest dwarf elephant. But these are not exceptions at all. Actually, elephants do it quite well. So enormous animals as they are be on the mainland, they are um, extreme good examples of island evolution on the northern hemisphere. 
You see them everywhere. And it seems that practically all genera of Pleistocene elephants uh, did it. This is Paleoloxodon, the, the straight-tusked elephant of the Pleistocene, for the Eastern Mediterranean. And you see that practically all islands had their elephants, their dwarf elephants, all of different sizes. And most of them are uh, independently, uh, evolved independently. So each island had its own species. And they dwarfed up to 2% from practically normal size to 2%, depending on the island and the time and isolation and other factors. For uh, Asia, you have stegodons, mainly dwarf stegodons. Also, they evolve a small body size. And also, in th that case, you see different sizes on different islands and in different contexts, different times. So overall, you see that hippos and elephants do it quite well. So you see here the, uh, the bunch of creatures. And this is, this is the normal pattern, but it's all gone today. And this is what most people don't know. Uh, carnivores also follow this rule. Most people think that on islands you do not have carnivores, and therefore the prey animals get smaller and blah, blah, and so on. That's not entirely true. On islands you may also have carnivores, but that's, they're very rare. And if you have them, the diversity is low, so you have only one taxon. And in that case, they generally get smaller, and that has, uh, we think, an energetic background. This is this uh, diagram of Carbona. You see that, I don't know if this pointer works. Um, no, I don't see actually any effect of the pointer. Okay, anyway, you see, uh, the, you see this green line, you see that uh, the very large carnivores, they are very limited in prey, they can eat only prey larger than themselves to get enough energy, while small-sized carnivores, on, this is on the mainland, eh, mainland. small-sized carnivores uh, ha can have a much broader dietary niche, they can, they can eat things smaller than themselves and they're much broader. So on islands it pays off, if you are large and you have to, this is Java for example, you have a wolf-sized sized dog-like creature in the early Pleistocene, and that was hunting likely deer, because you had deer there, but it pays off to become small. And in the middle Pleistocene, the early middle Pleistocene, you see a small carnivore, likely evolved from the big one. And that one had a broad dietary niche. You had many murids, so it can eat all kinds of smaller stuff, and reptiles, and so on. That was the mega fauna. What about the mini fauna? How, how mini, uh, nee, how mega can this mini fauna become? Uh, this is a very big one. This is the hair from uh, Menorca. It's about uh, 12 kilograms. So here you see the, a, bone, an, a bone element compared to a European hair. That is not entirely fair because that's not the ancestor, but by lack of ancestor, this is a comparably sized uh, rabbit. And this is about the size of a domestic uh, giant Flanders rabbit. And also picas, ochotonids, they're very small lagomorphs today. But in the past, on the islands, you had really big ones. So you see one of the teeth, and you see how, how big this teeth can be. This is on one island, and you see s uh, several anagenetic uh, stages. And on Timor, this one almost made it. It died, it got extinct one or two thousand years ago, likely in relation to the forest fires, so the habitat got reduced. This is something like five kilograms, and this is not the largest, but this is the, the most beautiful skull. Uh, but the extreme seems to be this one. This is an insectivore from the late Miocene of the Gargano, an island of Italy in the past. And this one evolved body size something like 200 times the ancestor body size. That is really gigantic. Uh, also here again, how does it look in reality? So this is uh, one of the mandibles of one of the larger forms compared to a mandible of an ancestor. So in body mass, this is huge. Uh, here is this island, because Italy, I don't know if you, uh, uh, most, most of you don't come from the Mediterranean area, but this, this is how Italy looked like in the late Miocene. You see that it's just a, a bunch of archipelagos. And on one of these archipelagos, you had a bizarre fauna. And this is, you would say, a um, mega mini fauna, but here is some doubt. This is the giant hutia of the West Indies, 200 kilograms, 
so quite big for a cavea. But on South America, you have really giant cavea, so this, this might actually be a dwarf mega cavea. So even if it is very big. A small excursion, how, you, how we know all these things? Uh, well, it's quite, quite a lot of work if you are busy with uh, um, mega mini fauna, even, uh, even if they are mega. You have to wash the sediments. And here you see you wash them first, and then you go to a one millimeter sieve, and after that you go to a half millimeter sieve. And then you pick, with many people, you pick the sediments. And if you're lucky, you find one element per day. So sometimes you have to sieve tons of material to get one element. Okay, so back to the fossils. You find bizarre cases. Eh? The, 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 the real giants and the real dwarfs that are not living anymore today. These are all off. And so we we'll had to look upon, and how is it then today? Because all, most models have been developed for the modern species. So we studied 439 uh, populations of mammals worldwide today, native mammals, from islands that have been isolated since the, the beginning of the Holocene, so just 12,000 years. So that is nothing compared to the millions of years the others had. Uh, yeah, and then you get this kind of boring scatter. So this is the, the idea of this type of scatter is to indicate the body size index, so how, how much different it is from the ancestor. If a body size is, if it is one, you are as big as your ancestor. If you are below the one, you are smaller. And if it is above one, you are bigger than your ancestor. And you see that around 10 kilograms, you have the, the turning point. Uh, we see an effect, and th then you can plot this against all kinds of variables, uh, island area, isolation, how many competitors, how many predators, and, and so on, but also the type of diet, and type of diet works fantastic. You see that uh, species with an uh, aquatic diet have the tendency to become much larger than species with a terrestrial diet, and here comes the explanation for this giant insectivore that we saw, that was eating aquatic prey. Uh, we know that from the dentition, and hence it could um, evolve a much, much larger body size than it would have done if it would have been restricted to terrestrial prey. So what we see if we compare the, the paleo and the neo species, native to their islands, that you have a Im very important aspect of time. So apart from diet and area isolation, time is really a good factor, and you see this, that the paleo insular species have a much steeper slope. This is the same type of slope, so with the body size index uh, as before. And you see that the extant natives are, uh, have a much less steeper slope. And the ancestors are, of course, one. And this aspect of time is very well uh, illustrated by Flores. On Flores, you, had, you have deposits of dwarf elephants from several ages through time. For example, here you see uh, at the one side, you see Liangbua, the surface, and you, uh, the, the cave. And at the other side, you see an open site. The open site is, is about a million years old. And the Liangbua cave is where the Homo floresiensis came from. What we see on Flores is that you had in the past on the lower uh, bar, you see a dwarf elephant, a giant tortoise, uh, a varan, and, and a giant rat. And that elephant became something like 15% the size of the ancestor. But that got replaced about a million years ago by this larger elephant. I cannot point it, but it is just above the small elephant. You see a larger elephant. So it got replaced by a bigger one. And the idea always was, you have also humans. Humans are also coming in at one million years about. The idea was that these humans, pr as predators, prevent the dwarfing of the elephant. You have a human, you, have, you don't have a dwarf elephant. That was fine. So for decades this model worked. But uh, this Liangboa cave has uh, lots of deposits and also younger ones. And now we know that the one... So if you follow in time, you go up from this larger elephant, you go up, you see that it also gets dwarf. And that gets 17% the size of the ancestor. So that's exactly the same as the dwarf elephant of before. So here you see that if you have time, so even with humans around, you become as small as the one from the former period. It's just time. Humans have nothing to do with it. So it is mainly time, but if you have competitors and, and, and real predators, I mean not humans, but things like uh, lions and tigers, uh, they, can, they can stop your, your dwarfing or gigantism. 
Uh, but there's not just this uh, island rule where you get this uh, in, in panel C, you see this convergence on, on the medium size, so A, they become either bigger or smaller, and, but you can also have a divergence. And these were the species we did not take into account. We did not take species that show this, let's say, adaptive radiation. Because what would you count? Who follows the island rule? So we, we took them out. But there are quite a lot of them. It's on the larger, as you know, this model, so in, in small islands you have only the immigration and the extinctions, but on the larger islands you have speciation as well, and this increases your biodiversity. And this speciation is then from single ancestors. So here in another type of graph, uh, so when you see also that isolation plays a role. If you have a large isolation, this can go better, but at some point in time nobody comes in. So we checked this also for the Paleo Islands, for uh, several islands on the planet. And only for those islands that had three uh, fauna lists. So you had only the, the, beginning, the beginning of the late Pleistocene, so the, the founders, uh, the end of the late Pleistocene, so that's the end fauna, and then today the Anthropocene. So what happens in these three periods? Uh, and then we found uh, accord this according to the model that you see that indeed founding assemblages, in, in blue the line below, they follow this uh, classic uh, species area relationship. And you see that the, the late, so the resulting assemblage, is after speciation but minus extinctions, so the, the late glacial maximum extinctions are off, you see that they are much steeper and they increase. So there you have in, in between, you have the difference in this, what does the speciation did with the, the fossil species. Uh, in a slightly different type of graph. So again, here you see that it, it goes up if you have a huge island area like Luzon and Madagascar. Uh, but we also saw that isolation does nothing. Isolation works for the founders, which is quite logic because you have to come to the islands, but after that, once you're there, if you have really the time, if you have Pleistocene time spans, then isolation does nothing for the speciation. Uh, this with the speciation is nothing special. It's actually already in textbooks. Uh, everybody knows about Darwin finches. And what's also well known is that you get the morphological diversity, so not only body size, but also for birds, big size. And in this way, you can occupy even a range in morphology that is compatible to that in, in the mainland uh, higher taxa, taxon orders. Uh, it's e it even enters the, the general public through museums, and I'm happy about that. I saw this in the Philippines. Happily surprised that the public learns about adaptive radiations. Uh, it is less well known for the mammals, and if it is known, it is, for example, for Luzon and Madagascar, it's known. Here you have these uh, cloud threads. You have the, the mini and the maxi form. of They derive from one single ancestor. Uh, but not well known is that it happened also with megafauna. This is these are a deer. This is a deer-like creature again from the Gargano, this late Miocene, and there you see on one island uh, four different uh, forms. So they all deviate in size, but also deviate a bit in in dentition. Uh, you see this also for Crete, the Ice Age of Crete. You see here again deer. So deer seem to do this very well. So you have this speciation in, in from small to very large, and they all have d occupy different ecological niches. The smallest one, according to us, is more like a goat. It really uh, it is very difficult to to tell apart the difference in the morphology between this deer and the goat, and we think that in this way it could really climb the rocks and maybe even trees as goats do. Uh, it had a truly bizarre antler. So it lost all the complexity. It's related to, we think it's related to fallow deer. And it lost all the complexity of a normal antler. It is just one long beam. So extremely long. So it is as if it kept the length, but reduced the complexity to, to keep uh, antler mass uh, the same. But all the species of this Cretan deer have a strange antler, but uh, you, you can see that the bow plan is the same. You can you can make one antler as as if you can make one antler into another antler. You just reduce tines and you elongate. So you have the, the dwarf species is on top, the smaller species has this, this weird antler, and the slightly larger species have less strange antlers. And there's even one with a almost normal antler. 
this adaptive radiation, of course, of today is uh, just a fraction of what you had in the past. For example, this is uh, Madagascar again. Um, later, more on Madagascar. Uh, you see here these giant lemurs, they're all off. But these guys are, are hundreds of kilograms. While today, lemurs are small or medium-sized. So when you put it in a graph, so this, the same islands that we used before, these Palio Islands for which you had the three sets, you can of course, if you have all these biodiversity data from the beginning of the late Pleistocene, the end and the Anthropocene, where we take actually the European expansion as Anthropocene, you can, you can turn around the data of course and you can see what's then extinct. And you see here in, in black uh, the species that are still there and in orange the species that are gone. Uh, and that is, of course, quite dramatic, as we all know, and it's mainly megafauna, but not just megafauna. For some archipelagos, you see even that uh, also the small things go off. The Mediterranean is especially bad. In the Mediterranean, uh, most things went off. And if you go to Crete, where you had this, this fabulous herd of, of deer, of uh, several deer species, today there's only one species of mammal that survived the, from the late Pleistocene, and that's just a shrew, an insect eater. A small insect eater is the only species that made it into today. All the rest is gone. And, and Madagascar and Luzon are actually the, the happy few examples where you still have lots of biodiversity, but in many islands it's all gone. Uh, and here you see what then happens. We hear this also this morning, that you see if you if you, the, the green line is the late Pleistocene biodiversity, you see in the uh, square dots, you see the biodiversity of today, the native biodiversity, and the other dots, the triangle dots, that is the natives plus the introduced. And there you see that we get a, an, an invasion, really, literally. So now the biodiversity on all these islands is expanding, but it's all uh, unnatural. So the natural ones are all below the green line for practically all islands. And then the introduced, if you add them, you get this. So what we're doing, we actually we replace these lovely dwarf elephants and dwarf hippos by introduced species like mouflon and ibex and goats. And this was uh, sadly said, this was said by Wallace, but uh, little did he know that this continued. So we're now a century, more than a century further, and we have practically only introduced species left. I thank you for your attention. <laughs> Any questions? Uh, thanks for your talk. Um, this is a bit far off the topic, but I was just wondering if you know anything about whether this island rule also applies to plants. Yeah, I, I, th I think it would apply, but I don't know. I don't know much about plants other than growing them. <laughs> but I, 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 th for example, you have, uh, I don't know if it was Mindoro or Mindanao, in the Philippines you have an island with a, with a pygmy forest. So all trees that are naturally large elsewhere are small there. But I think it's a bit different than I think that some species that are large on the mainland have become small there, yeah, and others uh, the opposite. But I don't know if there's a relation to the, um, the original size. But something happens on islands, that's for sure. Yeah, may maybe leaf size would do something. I have a question over here. <laughs> I was wondering if there is any data or if you know um, if megafauna and microfauna has been lost in the same percentage. So the extinctions have occurred uh, more frequently um, upon megafauna than upon macro microfauna or not? 
No, yeah, for example, Crete, actually everything went extinct there. So there you have, let's say, the same percentage. But it, it seems it is mostly the megafauna, but I have to admit that the fossil record of small things is, is always more incomplete than the fossil record of big things. So we might simply miss them. We, we don't know what was around. Yeah, Alexandra, thanks for a very nice talk. Just a question. Um, the disappearance of the megafauna in the islands is usually coinciding with the arrival of humans? Uh, well, um, we don't know exactly. I mean, there are many, we know many cases that that is not the case. There are many cases that uh, the megafauna was already extinct before humans came. And you have, you have also, you have this gray area. We, we, you don't have absolute dates for most things. And even if you find them together, then still you don't know if humans really were the cause of it. And if not humans? It could also be climate, for example. Climate. Climate. And island creatures are more vulnerable for whatever. But on the other hand, the climate is maybe a weak argument. Because during the Pleistocene, you had many glaciations, many um, changes in climate, and they survived it all. So why wouldn't you survive then the last one? No, so no. I don't think that climate is, is a good alternative. But it, it can be anything. Uh, we don't know. E even diseases. Uh, okay, and thanks. we don't know, of course, what is the natural uh, lifespan of a species. Mm -hmm. For example, for Crete, we know that uh, all these, these uh, deer... Uh, in, the, in the latest deposits, you have only the dwarf deer. So all the, the big deer went already extinct, and there were no humans involved there. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yes. We have time. So I, I, think we, uh, uh, I think we go to the next speaker. That is Steve Goodman from the Field Museum in Chicago and the Vahadra organization in Madagascar to talk about the past of Madagascar. Today he was talking about the, the conservation of Madagascar today, but now he will speak about the extinct fauna. Uh, thank you very much. So I'm actually going to talk about the, the period of interface of extinctions and when humans arrived. Uh, oh, there we go. Okay, we'll go on. So on Madagascar, amongst the, the modern people of Madagascar, there are two basic phenotypes. On the top, uh, we can refer to them as the Bantu girls, and these are two sisters from uh, same mother but different fathers, and three women of a distinctly Asiatic phenotype, and they have the same mother and the same father. And the question is, in order to understand what happened at the interface with extinction and what disappeared before humans arrived, we have to really uh, have detailed information of when was the first human colonization of Madagascar. Now, based on lots of genetic studies that have been done, even so the, the coastal is the Bantu phenotype, and you can see, depending on the region, it's largely African with a little bit of Asiatic and then European mixed in, but people from the high plateau that have the Asiatic phenotype, there's still a remarkable portion uh, whether it's maternal or uh, maternal or paternal markers, that's African in origin, and this is a very strange aspect. Now, this is from a very detailed study: uh, 280 villages, close to 3,000 people uh, across Madagascar, and the it's a genomic study, and it indicates that between two and 3,000 years ago there was a movement of Asiatic people, probably from the region of Borneo, more precisely probably Sarawak, that arrived in northern Madagascar. And soon thereafter, 500 to 1,000 years thereafter, there was a Bantu group that arrived in northern Madagascar. And uh, there was very, very quick admixture between these two groups and very, very rapid colonization of Madagascar based on the genetic data. 
And oh, I forgot a critical element. So th the story changes through time. So 20 years ago, if you ask the question, what's the first evidence of humans on Madagascar, it would have been 16th century, okay? And uh, then there was evidence of fifth or sixth century. And then uh, a few years back, uh, 15 years ago or so, there was a site that was found in southwestern Madagascar called Taolombibi that has lots and lots of extinct uh, animals and their knife marks. And most importantly, those are these are knife marks made with a metal object. So for a long time, this was the most uh, the earliest evidence of humans on Madagascar, but then there was a cave that was found in northern Madagascar with rock tools. The, the dating is open to question, uh, but based on the OSL dates about 4,400 years ago, we now have radiocarbon dates from the same cave in the same deposits that these stone tools were found, and it's probably closer to 3,500, and the OSL dates are not so accurate. So, but the thing that's critical there's evidence of Neolithic culture on Madagascar. And then very recently, an extraordinary find of uh, a deposit in the Isalu area. And these are elephant birds with very distinct knife marks and these knife marks were made with stone. So this is the first, the earliest evidence of humans on Madagascar close to 10,000 years ago. And it's abundantly clear that people arrive much, much earlier than uh, previously considered. Now, the, the critical thing is, in the study of genetic study, and there's a lot of work that's been done, all the genetic lineages represented uh, are modern people of Madagascar. And probably the best explanation for this is that these ancient Neolithic people disappeared from Madagascar and there was a second colonization of Madagascar by a mixture of Austro-Asians and then thereafter Bantus. So we're gonna use the date of about 9,000 years as the first evidence of humans on Madagascar, but almost certainly it's not the same people that live on Madagascar today. Okay, so amongst the, basically the Quaternary fauna, about 10% of the birds and close to 15% of the mammals no longer exist. And in recent years, there's been really a remarkable amount of work done on paleontology of Madagascar, late Pleistocene, Holocene, and there's just enormous amount of new information, specimens, et cetera, that are coming in that completely reset our previous ideas of this interface of megafauna and humans. This is in a cave in the north on Joey Bay. We're gonna talk a little bit more about this. And this is Pierre Mian, uh, many years ago, working in these caves. So paleontology is advanced, and then the critical thing is also archeology. span And uh, there's remarkable uh, groups of Malagasy archeologists that are working in many different areas and really understanding culturally how things evolved. And just once again, remarkable finds coming from many different areas of the island. Now, uh, looking at these fossils or subfossils, most of this material remains bone, so technically it's not really fossil, and oftentimes we use the term subfossil, but it, that's not really that important. So this is a, an African hippo, and this is one of the dwarf hippos, and by finding remains of hippos in any deposit, uh, it implicitly means that there was fresh water and it was permanent fresh water during the period that the, the hippos were alive. And then if you look at lemurs, for example, these are two genera, Paleopropithecus and Babacutia, and these, based on the, the anatomy of these animals, they were basically unable to walk on the ground. You can see, for example, in this uh, Paleopropithecus, the, the toes are actually curved and physically, they, they might have been able to kind of s move slightly on the ground, but they were canopy dwelling animals. And by finding these bo bones of these genera and deposits, once again, it means that it was a closed canopy forest during the period that these animals were alive. 
But it, uh, someone asked a question earlier. We refer often to the megafauna extinction of Madagascar, and that's an artifact of how paleontologists worked in previous generations. And now that the deposits are being sieved and fine bone is being recovered, we have lots and lots of uh, extinct microfauna. This is a small microgill uh, of probably six to eight grams. And so it's probably incorrect to talk about megafauna extinctions because it, once again, as Alexandria mentioned, it touched the, the, the fawn in general. Okay, now uh, we're gonna take two case examples that show completely different patterns of that interface of what happened with animals disappearing and humans arriving. Uh, a few years back with a colleague, Bill Jungers, we did an analysis of Everything here in red are either paleontological or archaeological sites around Madagascar. You can see there's really a, a remarkable number of sites, but inconsistent information, whether there's paleontological studies associated with the, these deposits and archaeological uh, ideas or archaeological information coming from the region. So we were able to kind of distill all of these sites down to just a few, and this is addressed in a, a book called Extinct Madagascar. And in that book, uh, we deal with 14 different sites, and today we're only gonna talk about two, starting with Anjoe Bay in the Northwest. This is the habitat of Anjoe Bay today. Uh, grasslands, it's not savanna, because it's not a climax community that's dominated by one genera of palm trees, and there's not much in the way of forest that occurs near Anjoe Bay today. And based on our uh, reconstructions of the different types of animals that were found in the Anjoe Bay caves and the Anjoe Bay system, I'm sorry, it's a little bit small, but there's the sloth lemurs that never came down to the ground, giant kuas, uh, archaeolemur, and it was clearly a closed canopy forest uh, about 4,500 years ago. And in the cave systems, there's a remarkable number of hippos, extinct bats, etc. So it was distinctly different uh, a few thousand years ago than today, and the question to ask is, what happened? And uh, so if you look at radiocarbon dates from the site, extinct taxa, locally extirpated taxa, ex uh, extant local taxa and introduced, you can see how they fall out in time and there's a very clear division between what's disappeared and what remains, and very little, bit, very little overlap. And if you look at uh, carbon isotope ratios in these bones, you see that most of the, ex well, the extinct stuff, they had C3 diets. Uh, the locally extirpated had largely C3 diets, and then very, very quickly, things changed to C4 plants in this area. And this is a d data from a sp two different speleothems coming from Anjoui Bay. And it, it's quite remarkable. They show the same pattern. And basically, about a little bit less than 1,000 years ago, there was a massive, massive change that took place over 85 years. This all happened in 85 years. The C3 plant community disappeared, and everything became C4. And at the same time, this is with oxygen isotopes that are, can, is a measure of what's happening with rainfall. It's very, very consistent through time, and whatever happened in Joey Bay is completely human-related with the destruction of the forest and has nothing to do with climatic change. Okay, you see how that works through? So, in summary, for on Joey Bay, uh, there are 11 species of lemurs known from the site. Four are extinct and one locally extirpated. The one that's extirpated is a bamboo lemur that only occurs in a small area of eastern Madagascar. There, it's a lot of radiocarbon dates. Uh, 28 is wrong now. It's probably closer to 36. And these dates run from about 8,000 years ago to 200 years ago. And the most recent extinct uh, lemur is an archaeolemur from about 3,000 years ago, I'm sorry, from 1,000 years ago, and a hippo from 3,000 years ago. So all of those extinctions more or less fall into that window of massive human change 
in the area. And the other thing that's important, the first archaeological evidence from Anjoy Bay is from 1400 years ago. So the cause, human modifications of the natural environment. Next site is Tsimana Pitsuts. This is a zone in the southwest, a region that receives about 300 to 400 millimeters of rainfall per year. This is what it looks like today. Very uh, spiny bush. And this is a reconstruction of uh, Tsimana Pitsuts, uh, where there was vast areas of fresh water, lots of freshwater birds, hippos, etc. Two genera of elephant birds, on and on. So it was very, very different about 4,000 years ago. Now, just very briefly, this is an analysis of uh, nitrogen isotopes in a range of different bones. Tsirarif, uh, these are uh, the Tropithecus veroxi is a living animal. Pachylemur insignis is uh, extinct. But the most important one to compare is Tawalambibi and Basamafali. Tawalambibi, these are all subfossils. Basamafali are living animals. And you can see, based on these isotopes, the, the material, the subfossil material from Tawalambibi uh, seems to indicate that the, when these things were living, uh, it was distinctly more arid. So, in summary, for Tsimana Pitsuts, there's giant carnivores, Spelia from 2,000 years ago, and then a whole host of bizarre lemurs that had those long, sloth like forearms that are as recently as 1,200 years ago. And there were hippos in Tsimana Pitsuts, once again, the, dis, uh, the extinction of these animals rather than any human aspect. So, in conclusion, over the past few millennia, there have been uh, rather dramatic changes to the ecosystems of Madagascar. No single explanation. All those 14 sites that we analyze in the book show a different pattern of the interface of natural climatic change and human intervention. And in certain areas, such as in Joey Bay, uh, human modification of the environment is the best explanation. And in the southwest, near Tsimana Pitsuts, it seems to be largely uh, natural climatic change driven. So thank you very much for your attention. Hey, uh, thank you, Steve, for your wonderful talk. A nice supplement to what you talked yesterday. Uh, are there any questions? Yeah. <coughs> Yeah, thank you very much. This is very interesting, and especially uh, the um, yeah all these kind of constructions. That, uh, but I wonder when you when you uh, when you conclude the cause for the extinction, okay, uh, and say this is climate, this is humans, okay. So and this is also because before we heard of uh, why they would all survive the um, different the different uh, climates, okay? So wouldn't wouldn't the right question be uh, would these animals uh, not be extinct if humans never reach Madagascar? That would be the question, right? That we have to ask. Okay. No, thank you for the question. So the way that I tried to present it is based on. Uh, modern ecology, ancient ecology, human use of the environment, dates when humans arrived, there's no single answer to the question of what happened on Madagascar. You have to take each of those zones with their very different set of variables and ask the question separately, okay? And it's abundantly clear that certain sites, the extinction of a lot of organisms wasn't human driven in other areas, like on Joey Bay or on the central highlands of Madagascar, it's largely or exclusively human driven. So a complex response to a simple question. Thank you for the, thank you for the talk. Um, in the place where you've ascribed the, whatever it was, thousand year old change, which you believe was human driven, um, I'm interested on your speculation as whether it was humans driving environmental modification and whatever, burning or whatever they did to turn it for, into that savanna-like environment from a forested one that led to the disappearance of the fauna or 
to what extent is direct chopping them up and eating them implied? So in the spelia thems that were analyzed, uh, that we only talked about the stable isotope aspects of those spelia thems. Uh, in the pollen, there's interesting things that show up almost immediately with the destruction or the change in, from C3 to C4, including pollen of things like cannabis. So human nature hasn't changed very much over the years. And, uh, and associated with that, it was a, a very, very, well, also there's the, the thin, thin, fine dust of fires, carbon that are in the speleothems, and it shows a massive increase at that same period where there's a shift to C4 of, and it's clear that it's fire and uh, human driven. Uh, time for one question only. I was wondering how can you be sure that the hippos of Madagascar required fresh water? Because uh, I guess Alexandra can correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought that, the, for instance, the dwarf hippo of Crete is thought to be relatively terrestrial, and why wouldn't the, couldn't the hippos of Madagascar be rather terrestrial as well, and not necessarily requiring fresh water? So, on Madagascar there were three species of hippos that are now extinct. One is very large, more or less the size of the African amphibious, and the other two were very small. And there have been lots of sites that have been excavated in Madagascar, open air sites, cave sites, and they're always associated with uh, alluvial sediment, okay? And areas that have been excavated out of alluvium, there's no hippo remains. So based on the natural history of living hippos, including the dwarf hippos of Liberia, et cetera, and the types of deposits that the hippo bones have been found, the extrapolation is that they were aquatic or largely aquatic as uh, modern hippos. I, I thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, the, the next speaker is uh, Julian Louis from the Griffith University in uh, of Australia, Brisbane, to talk about uh, Sumatra. Thank you, Alexandra. So Sumatra is uh, Indonesia's largest island, and it's the sixth largest island um, uh, within the uh, within the Wallacean area, within the Sundaland area. Um, and you can see that it's quite a large uh, nor uh, north, south, east, west uh, bearing island, and it's uh, home to a diverse uh, suite of faunas. Uh, many of them are heavily critically endangered. Um, includes many megafauna such as elephants, rhinos, tigers. Uh, orangutans, tapirs, and so forth. One of the things about Sumatra is that during uh, glacial periods, so during the majority of the Pleistocene, it was actually connected uh, in, in, in many instances to, uh, to Java, to Borneo, and to Mani Peninsular Malaysia. And when it was joined to those sorts of areas, um, that exposed a, a low-lying uh, shelf, low-lying continental shelf known as the Sunda Shelf, and it's hypothesized that as a result of this low-lying Sunda shelf, uh, you get a change in the hydrological regime, uh, ha a change in uh, the intertropical convergence zone, and you get the exposure of a uh, savanna corridor running through the center, basically, of this ancient Sundaland. Uh, but you can see that the, 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 the width of the corridor is supposed to basically have only encompassed the, um, the eastern side of Sumatra, uh, parts of the southern parts of Borneo, and the central part of Java. So the first paleontological uh, excavations in Sumatra were done by Eugene Dubois. So when basically when Eugene Dubois was looking for the origins of humans, uh, so he was looking for the, the missing link, uh, he was first stationed in, Padang, in the Padang Highlands in western Sumatra. And there he employed a large team of both um, of military people as well as uh, indentured slaves essentially uh, in Indonesia to explore as many cave systems as he possibly could. Um, all of the caves that he found, he found uh, quite a lot of fossil material in there with many thousands of specimens that are housed in uh, the Naturalis Museum now. Um, but because they all represented extent, extant species, he thought that they were very quite young, so basically Holocene, only the last few thousand years or so. Um, and he grew disillusioned with Sumatra within about two years. And when he found, when he heard about find, fossil finds in Java, he relocated there. And of course, um, several years later, he found the holotype. So this is the area um, that 
Dubois worked in, they're known as the Padang Highlands, um, and mostly he worked out of Pai Kumbu, uh, and he spent a lot of time in Bukatingi as well. The two major cave sites that he found in Sumatra uh, are Lida Aya, which basically means water tongue, uh, and another site called Sibrambang. Now, for Lida Aya, this is the first major paleontological find that he made on the island, and so it was quite widely publicised. He kept very good notes about where it was and how the cave was situated, what it looked like, and so on. Unfortunately, uh, by the time he got to Sibrambang, he was a little bit uh, less enthusiastic and he didn't keep any detailed notes, so we still don't know exactly where this particular site is in Sumatra. As I said, he grew disillusioned. He went to, to Java and within about a year or so, he found the holotype of Homo erectus uh, in tr at Trinil. So both these sites, Lida Aya and Sibrambang, uh, host a diverse suite of uh, modern South, uh, Southeast Asian and typically Sumatran uh, fauna. Um, one of these has got 27 taxa, mostly large and very large bodied species. Uh, Sibrambang has a few more, um, as well as has the only record of uh, an extinct carnivore from, uh, from Sumatra. It's, the, uh, it's, it's still alive today, but it's locally extinct, the, the leopard. Um, th one of the major things about Lida Aya is that uh, at the time, Dubois didn't recognise it, but amongst the, all the orangutan teeth that he collected, he found a number of, uh, there were a number of human teeth, but these weren't recognised until the 1950s when Dirk Huyer actually went through the collections uh, and, and systematically described all of the material from there. Now this is the, uh, this is the cave breccia from which those human teeth were, were derived. Uh, you can see there's some uh, stalactite, stalactite sorry, formations with a flow stone. And essentially uh, a team that I was involved with went back to the cave in 2015. We extracted um, um, some dating materials and we were basically able to constrain the age of the deposition of this particular site to between 62 and 72,000 years. Um, and this actually represents the oldest evidence for modern humans in Southeast Asia, um, as well as the first uh, indirect evidence of human occupation of rainforests. So for Sibrambang, we can't actually go back to the site to try to date it, but we can try to date the material that Dubois uh, excavated, and we use a method called uranium series uh, dating. Basically, it's, it's, it's very similar to the radiocarbon dating method that most people are familiar with, but unlike uh, radiocarbon, uh, which only goes back basically 50,000 years in a best case scenario. In the tropics, it's very rare for radiocarbon dating to be useful beyond about 10,000 years. So we use another method, the uranium series. Um, unfortunately, well, fortunately perhaps, human or any other uh, bone material or tooth material does not naturally contain uranium. So that means that essentially any uranium found within these fossils is an uptake that's been, that has happened after the bones were deposited. So as such, although we're looking at the decay of uranium in the tooth or the bone, uh, it only provides a minimum age. So we're dating basically the time since the uranium was uptaken uh, by those particular uh, elements. And you can see that for the Sibrambang material, we dated two orangutan teeth, we dated a tapir tooth, and we also dated that extinct um, Sumatran leopard. And they gave a range of dates for, for that particular deposit. We suggest that there's actually more than one depositional event happening within that particular cave. All of these are, are late Pleistocene, and some of them are quite old, up to um, 160,000 years. Um, uh, and that's, again, a minimum age, so it could be considerably older than that as well. Um, as, while we were out there, we also took the chance to do a little bit of uh, cave survey to see if we could find some additional uh, cave material, uh, some new sites potentially. And uh, this particular site that we found, the Lao Sam Pit, was actually also um, briefly mentioned in Dubois Field Notes. Um, you can see that uh, at the moment when we went there, it was actually the, the, it looked like the, the home of somebody, but anyway, we went past their stuff and uh, went through a, a crawly area. And we found basically this, uh, a much larger chamber within the system, uh, as well as two little tunnels, two little offshoots, and fossil material was found uh, both at both ends of that uh, particular deposit. Now, this particular deposit is uh, relatively unique in Sumatra in containing actual almost complete crania. You can see here that's the brain case of what we suspect is a fossilised pig. Um, the vast majority of material from these Sumatran caves, I'm talking 95, 99% of the material, uh, is composed of isolated teeth. And that's, uh, we think that's because that these, the fossil accumulation was done by porcupines. So essentially porcupines will go out into the landscape, they will collect bones and skulls and, and whatnot to bring back into the cave. They'll gnaw those down and they'll gnaw them down basically down to the tooth nubs. So all that we get left most of the time are tooth crowns. Um, we dated some flow stones, so basically uh, providing a maximum age for this particular deposit at about 90,000 years. Uh, 
Uh, and since then, we've also been able to get more uranium series dates on some material that we've um, gotten from this particular deposit. We've got pigs uh, and cervids at around about the same time as well. Uh, and a bovid for slightly younger in a, in a slightly different part of the, different part of the cave. Uh, by far the most uh, exciting and interesting cave that we found was a site called Nalao Gupin. Um, so this particular site is much, much larger than both Lida Aya and Nalao Sampit. And the fossil deposit occurred in two major areas. You can see here with the blue uh, circles. One was a lithified brecciated deposit uh, and the other one was an unconsolidated uh, deposit just beneath it. So we think that one is eroding out into the other. Uh, we have pigs at about 30,000, uh, we have rhinos at about 42,000, another pig at 30, uh, and again some rhinos and some pigs at about uh, 50,000. Again, these represent minimum ages. Uh, this is a, just to show you a picture of that particular deposit there. You can see that this is a tooth being pointed at just here, and the breccia essentially occurs in the little nooks and crannies of that particular uh, cave system. Um, the, one of the teeth that we have had uh, dated from that particular site uh, reliably is a uh, tapir tooth and has been reliably dated to about 42,000 years. Uh, most interestingly, we managed to find the first record of hexaprotodon. This is the dwarf hippo. It's actually quite widespread throughout Southeast Asia, but this is the first record that we have of this particular taxon um, from uh, Sumatra. And you can see here, that's the tooth. It's a lower right uh, uh, second molar. And this is compared to uh, the um, extant uh, species of dwarf hippo. So in addition to that particular uh, hippo, Sumatra has a very sparse extinction records. Uh, there is uh, records, there's fossil records of the Banteng in uh, Sumatra in those fossil caves that I just described. Uh, however, it's no longer found on the island today. And in fact, it's, it's relatively uh, endangered across um, Southeast Asia and its most stable and, and, and uh, healthy population is in the north of Australia. There's also records of the water buffalo, again from these Sumatran caves, but there's no records of, of the water buffalo there today. And finally, uh, the Javan rhino. Uh, there's historical records, obviously, of the Javan rhino occurring on Sumatra, uh, but it's not actually occurring there today. So what's going on with these? So one of the things that we're trying to get at is the paleo environments and the paleo climates that were around at the time of these fossil that, the, that these fossils were deposited in. And one of the ways that we're trying to get at that is to look at uh, stable isotopic analysis. So for those of you that aren't familiar with how stable isotopes works in terms of uh, mammal teeth and especially fossils, um, we're basically looking at two uh, major isotopes, carbon isotopes and oxygen isotopes. Now carbon isotopes uh, are uptaken by plants in different ways through different photosynthetic pathways uh, and essentially you can get a differentiation between C3 plants uh, which have a highly negative delta-13 C uh, value, and they're usually comprised of things like trees or bushes or browse and things like that, uh, whereas C4 plants have much po more positive values of delta-13 C, and they're usually associated with things like tropical grasses uh, and so on. So when uh, animals, herbivores, eat these particular types of plants, those carbon isotopic signatures are then transferred to the teeth uh, of the particular animals. And these, uh, these signals have been shown to be very resistant to diagenesis, so to the changes that might occur to the fossil as it's being, um, being fossilised, essentially. Uh, and so you, what you'll find is that you can, you can get a dichotomy between either pure grazers, which will come out with a very positive delta-13 C value. Uh, pure browsers will come out with a very uh, positive, uh, sorry, a very negative delta-13 C value, and then mixed feeders will have something in between. Oxygen isotopes are a little bit more complicated. Uh, they, they, essentially what happens is the lighter oxygen isotope, oxygen isotope 16, uh, gets, gets evaporated from oceans and water bodies much more readily than its heavier uh, delta-18 isotope. But when it comes to precipitation, the heavier isotope gets deposited, gets uh, rained down, uh, gets um, moved on much more uh, readily. And so again, animals will ingest uh, this particular oxygen isotope ratio through either drinking water uh, or it can also be absorbed through plants and things like that. It's a little bit more complicated than the carbon cycle, but essentially it's a good indicator of what the paleo climate was doing. So we applied this carbon oxygen isotope uh, analysis to both a large range of extant Southeast Asian faunas uh, in order to get a modern baseline of what was happening within the, within the region today. Uh, and we also looked at uh, the same carbon oxygen isotopes uh, in a range of uh, different 
uh, fossil taxa that we had recovered from those particular caves. And when we look at the different communities and even when we look within particular different groups, uh, we find no significant differences between the uh, ancient fossilised uh, oxygen isotopes and the uh, modern systems. So we, said we, we basically using that to suggest that uh, both the, the, the range of diets, the range of plants that these animals were eating, as well as um, the paleoclimate, was remarkably similar in the Pleistocene as it was to today. So how does that gel up with our extinction scenario? And of course, how does this sit within the whole megafauna extinction debate? Uh, we've heard quite a lot already about megafauna extinctions. And of course, one of the dominant theories about the megafauna extinctions is that humans came through and wiped out the larger species uh, as soon as they were colonizing an island or a continent. Well, in Sumatra, we still have the largest members of the, of the large mammal community still present, admittedly, incredibly endangered, some of them, but they are still nevertheless present on the island. So we haven't seen the wipeout of the largest species on the island. We seem to be, it seems to be the body weight category below these that are being effect, most affected. Um, and again, we're not seeing a huge amount of change in terms of the environment. So one idea be, that could potentially explain this pattern um, is, uh, this is a modeling uh, analysis that's been done by uh, two authors, Granados and Brody. And essentially, they looked at uh, the annual exploitation rate, how the annual exploitation rate would affect extinction of different body-sized ungulates in, in South and Southeast Asia. And in particular, they looked at the muntjac, which is a very small species. They looked at, this, uh, at rusa, which is a, a large deer species, and of course, the elephant. And what they found was that for, um, for the very large species, it made no difference whatsoever whether the annual exploitation rate was increased or not. But for the, for the large and the, and the medium-sized mammals, uh, a change in annual exploitation rate in conjunction with uh, large amounts of uh, environmental change could uh, drive the extinction rate a lot more quickly than, um, than just one or the other by themselves. So potentially we're seeing something like this uh, in terms of the why only... Um, medium and, and large-bodied species are being affected by this extinction. We might be seeing some sort of environmental change that we're not picking up in the ex oxygen or carbon isotopes at the same time as seeing an increase in uh, hunting pressure. And with that, I'll leave it and I'll thank you and I think I have time for some questions. Thanks. Yeah, and any questions for Julian? We have plenty of time. Well, in case there's no question, I, I can have a question. <laughs> this, uh, this hippo, uh, how dwarf was it? Uh, it's about the same size as the modern uh, dwarf hippo. So yep. it was dwarf? Yes. Yeah. Well, it's, it's smaller than the, than the uh, yes, than hippopotamus amphibious, yes. And, 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 sp and smaller as well than the hexaprotodon from Java. And, uh, and other yeah. places in Southeast Asia, yes. Yeah, because you have to see it with the, the mainland. Yes, Africa, of right? course, okay. yep. yeah. Well, uh, there are no questions anymore for Julian. Uh, I suggest we move on to the next speaker then. That is uh, Thomas Angic from the National uh, Museum in Paris, Natural History. And he will talk about early human activities in Luzon. Okay, well, thank you. Indeed, we'll talk about um, the Philippines and early colonization of the Philippines now. Uh, first question is uh, where, and second question is when. So where we are on Luzon Island, one of the biggest islands of uh, the Philippines, and uh, when we've dated uh, the site of Kalinga to 700,000 years, I don't come back on the, on the date, it has been published, and that's not the, the topic of today. Um, also not the topic of today is the recent uh, discovery, three months ago, of this Homo Lucenensis. It's not far from, uh, we'll Actually, we'll talk a bit about, la uh, about that. It's not far from where we excavated. That's Kalao Cave, where this Homolus analysis is coming from. That's a cave site. It's dated to 70,000 years old, 
more or less. And uh, we are uh, working on Kalinga site. It's much older, it's 700,000 years old, so it's 10 times older. That's an opener site. The connection between the two is not clear. Um, this used to be the uh, oldest site of the Philippines until we, we found this one. So you can see that we have a big uh, gap between 700,000 and 70,000. So what's happening in between is not clear. In Kalinga sites, then, it's an opener site, as I said. We found uh, several bones, not that deep, actually, and also stone tools. Here are the bones. Here is what we call a tectite. So that's uh, more or less related to the impact of a meteorite that uh, uh, impacted Earth in, uh, in, in southern China, most likely, about 800,000 years ago. So we knew more or less that we were not far from this range. And indeed, the later dates confirm this. Uh, so the, this early, uh, the early middle Pegasus in transition for the site. So, several bones, several stone tools. Most of the bones are belonging to rhino, and that's what we will talk about today. Rhinoceros philippinensis, here are many of those bones. You have ribs, some of them are still in connection, but most of the bones are not in connections anymore. So it's not in anatomical connection. And this is because um, this rhino has been butchered by humans. So we have indirect evidence of humans through the presence of the stone tools, but also through the presence of uh, butchery marks, cutting marks on the ribs, on the legs as well, and uh, percussion marks on the, some of the long bones, notably the, the two humeri that have been uh, uh, crushed. Oh, yeah, they try to break it at least. For this individual, so most of the bones have been retrieved. It's 75 percent, we would say. We we still have some to discover, but uh, we already uh, found a lot, belonging to uh, not so young individual, but not so old neither. So whether it died from natural death or not, that is not clear. Whether it's induced by humans or not, is not clear. But it has been butchered, that's for sure. There is no doubt on that. So several cutting marks, but not only rhino. We also have. Uh, some other animals, not a huge diversity though, but uh, we are on an island. Uh, we have, uh, I said turtle, but it's tortoise, box tortoise. Uh, we, we, we call that box turtle, but it's a tortoise. It's, it's a terrestrial uh, one, it's Cura orbuinensis. Uh, we have uh, Varan, uh, uh, Salvator, uh, Varanus Salvator, so monitor lizard. We have Stegodon, that is a proboscid that is related to. Uh, to elephants uh, that is extinct now. We have deer, the present day deer. So this is extinct, 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 extinct. This is extinct and this is extinct now. So rhino. So this rhino is the interest for the, the talk of today. It has been described in the 1950s, in 1953, by a famous um, German paleontologist, von Königswald, from uh, several uh, remains, few, but uh, several of them, uh, found on surface in uh, several places in the Philippines. So it was all over the place, even in Palawan Islands. That uh, is one of the main gates, supposedly, to the, to the Philippines, according to uh, biologists and to uh, people working on murids and uh, also on birds. So it has been described as a new species, distinct, distinct from everything that was uh, found uh, uh, anywhere in Southeast Asia. That's von Königswald. He was invited by this guy, Bayer, doing a congress, just like uh, we are here. And that's when he had a look to all those fossils collected on surface and described them. So the question is the validity of this uh, species that was described for on few remains. And now we have a, an almost complete skeleton, so we could uh, work uh, a bit more on that. So the method we, do, we use is cladistics. So searching for uh, new traits and uh, shared new traits, uh, unique new traits and shared new traits on, um, on fossils and also on, uh, on recent species and to see the, try to see the, the, the relationship between uh, all of them. So we have a total of 277 uh, morphoendomical characters for everything, skull, teeth, and uh, postcranial. And uh, we have uh, quite a large sample of species, actually uh, the largest so far, even for molecular studies, because of course we are including fossils that are not uh, accessible for uh, paleogenetics. So we have about uh, 30 species. And here's the, the result of the analysis. So we have uh, external uh, uh, 
species that we include to root the tree. We have a total of 20 apomorphies and we find back uh, the natural clouds. So the, um, the main, sorry, that's here. The rhinocerotine here, we find the, the main class, so the Asian and the African rhino are all grouped together in one cluster. We find the uh, rhinocerotine, although it is not uh, uh, one uh, single origin, so it is not properly rooted, but that's normal. It's because here we are missing a lot of myosin uh, species and uh, perosilactides used to be uh, very diverse, actually, that were the most uh, numerous and the most common ungulates during the Miocene, and we could not include uh, most of them. So that's, that's normal, but at least the uh, other suprageneric uh, groups, and most, uh, most notably the rhinoceros genus, is uh, monophyletic here in our analysis, if that makes sense. The two-horned uh, rhino from Sumatra, the one uh, Julien uh, talked about earlier, no, it, it was Japanese rhino, right? You talked in Sumatra. But nowadays you have uh, two-horned rhinos in, uh, in Sumatra, this is Sumatrensis. That's a huge problem for uh, everyone, for paleontologists, but also for uh, molecular biologists. And no one knows where to root it, what is the sister taxa, and uh, what to do with that. All the, all the studies uh, disagree. So, because you have one uh, two-horned rhino in, uh, in Africa and one in, Java, in, uh, in Sumatra, so in Asia, and you don't know what to, uh, what's the origin of that. You have to look further in the Miocene, but at least this structure here with the sister taxa of all the rhinoceros for this aurinus, for two-horned rhino, is in, a, is in good agreement with the latest molecular studies. And that's quite rare that paleontologists agree with uh, molecular biologists, so it has to be highlighted here, even more that we are in an island biology congress, so with a lot of biologists. So what we have in the detail, 10 unambiguous uh, apomorphies with this disaurinus, and we can see clearly three clouds. So you have this Diceorinus sumatrensis, that's one genus. Then you have the rhinoceros genus with all the Javanese species, Chinese species. And you have the Philippine rhino that is linked to two other species. And most likely you should have a new genus here. So something different, something new based on this uh, newly uh, species with this complex specimen. In details, several characteristics, several uh, autapomorphies for the new genus, and several, so for the three species here, and several autapomorphies for this uh, smaller cloud here, grouping uh, Rhinoceros Ayazakai and uh, Philippinensis. All the three are fossils. Huh? Uh, I don't detail them. You have uh, them listed here. So in green, these are the uh, autopomorph is shared for the whole genus, and in red, the autopomorph is shared for uh, two species here. So you have, see, the continuous uh, protolof here that is continuous here as well, while here it's cut. These kind of characteristics are clearly uh, differentiating um, within the genus, the different species. So what does it mean? Here's a complex map, so we stop a bit on that to describe it. You have several uh, uh, paleontological and archaeological sites where several rhino species have been uh, discovered, extinct species, but also uh, species that still uh, exist nowadays in Southeast Asia. The rhinoceros uh, fuzuiensis, the one grouping with the Philippine rhino, is coming from southern, southeastern China. The rhinoceros uh, ayazakai is the one discovered, badly described, but uh, so the age is not clear but uh, coming from Taiwan. The Fuzuensis is uh, supposed to be two million years in China. And the rhinoceros philippinensis here from northern Luzon that is 700,000 years old so far. So this is the cloud we have. It has nothing to do clearly in the cladistics with everything you find in Java in the past or nowadays. And the fossil record of Java is quite clear, quite complete, quite old, 1.8 million years so far. and. Uh, if there is no relation, we are quite sure that there is no connection between the two. So what can we can suspect? For the longest time, two migration routes have been proposed by paleontologists to uh, Java Island. A very early one, early uh, Pleistocene, with fauna coming from Indonesia. That's the work of John DeVos, a good colleague of us. 
coming from India and reaching Java Island, and the modern fauna, the same that uh, Julian described for uh, Sumatra before, so with orangutan, with this kind of species, the, the bear, etc., coming from uh, southern China. Here we are proposing a new route, new migration route, connecting southern China, Taiwan, and the Philippines. That's the same kind of analysis uh, Alexandra explained uh, earlier on. So we are just comparing the body mass, or reconstructing the body mass of the fossils, comparing the body mass of the island form with the mainland form, and try to see the change in size between the islands and the mainland form. Two interesting things here. First, so one is the size of the mainland form. If the two island forms are uh, the same size with the mainland form, they should be close to one here. They are below one, so this means that they are smaller. Rhinoceros Ayazakai, smaller than the mainland form, and Rhinoceros philippinensis, smaller than the, the two other forms. Interesting is that mainland form, this is a continental island, and this is an oceanic island. And the best, uh, as far as I know, this is the first time we, uh, we have such an evidence for a, a gradual reduction of size from mainland to uh, continental island until uh, uh, oceanic island. I still have 50 slides, huh? so don't. Uh, second interesting thing here, is it's not dwarf, it's small size, but Homo lucanensis is not dwarf, neither. it's small size, it's within the smallest Homo sapiens. Uh, right now, so it's not dwarf, it's small size. Second interesting thing is that um, this is the first time we have uh, confirmation that the island rule also works for perisodactyles. Perisodactyles are not that frequent on islands, and that is the first time we have confirmation it works for them too. There was no reason to doubt it would not work for them, but still that's quite interesting to, to see that it does work. So, on this complex map, you also have sea surface currents that are represented, and you have wind. If you look at sea surface currents, you would see that in the north of the Philippines, most of the currents are flowing off the Philippine coast. In the southwest, where you have Palawan Island, it's flowing southwest. In Sulu, you also have strong currents. The question is, where did they come from? Did they come from the north or from the, the southwest, or even the, the southeast, or from Sulawesi, from the south? If you just look at sea surface currents, knowing that most certainly those large animals reach the islands by swimming, it looks like they would have never succeeded to reach the Philippines. So it cannot be the only answer. But if you look at winds, you are on the north of the hemisphere for the Philippines, so the winds are blowing and converging toward the, the equator, and the winds are blowing to the south. And this might be one of the best uh, action to help for uh, migration for those uh, swimming uh, large uh, animals. And that would make sense with the connection we have between Java, um, China, Taiwan, and the Philippines. We have another evidence beyond the rhino that we found on the surface. This is the tooth of a large uh, tusked uh, suid that is present in the Philippines. We found it on the surface, so we don't know the edge, but it's close to the uh, rhinoceros. And the only other place on Earth where this uh, large tusk suede is known, is Sulawesi. So here again, you have a connection between uh, Sulawesi and the Philippines, so you can even most likely continue this uh, arrow down to the south. So China, Taiwan, the Philippines, Sulawesi, one island uh, beyond would be Flores Island. And now Flores is just at the connection between, at the, the crossroad between the routes of migration going to Java and the route of migration going to the Philippines and most likely to Sulawesi. In the Philippines, you have this Homo sulusonensis. In Flores, you have this Homo floresiensis. Where do they come from? That's the main question. In the Philippines, you have a big gap, I've told you, between our site and the Homo lusonensis. So it's not clear yet if it's related, if we have, if the tool makers and the, the people who butcher the rhino are linked are the ancestor of the Homo lusonensis, but we are still excavating there. And for Homo floresiensis, where did it come from? From the west or from the north? That's one question. You have the Indonesian through flow that is also flowing to the south, but again, winds are supposed to be better uh, factors for uh, dispersion. Thank you.
Okay. Thank you, Thomas, <laughs> for your interesting talk. Are there any questions or comments? Hi. Uh, in the case of the rhinos, how do you decide which is the mainland form to compare it with? Because in some cases it might not be so um, clear cut, I guess, for those, those plots that you showed. Well, we have a cladistic analysis that shows that the sister taxa of the, the two island forms is uh, Rhinoceros fuzuensis. So, so this Chinese form. form. So we fellow. compare with the mainland form with this Rhinoceros uh, fuzuensis, and that's the closest relative. Okay. And you always have uh, a pair to uh, a, sp a specific species that you compare it with? For the uh, rhino, that was easy because we n know the ancestor. But we we don't only we not only know the ancestor that what Alexander has shown before, and in that case, you take something that might look like. Okay. Any other question? We have really plenty of time. So everybody accepts the route of course. via Philippines, Sulawesi to Flores for the humans? Great. Okay, okay. Hi. Thanks for a very, very nice, very nice talk. Just a question. You said that the Homo lusonensis was not exactly a dwarf. Homo, just a small one. Although Homo floresiensis is a dwarf Homo. Can you explain it, this a little bit more? I mean, it is not, it is something between the ancestor and Homo floresiensis. And then if you are colonization route to Flores is the, the one you'd propose. It is a subsequent, um, pass to, towards um, dwarfism? Um, no, not exactly. So two things. Um, first, if you look at the publication of Homo Luzanensis, they don't describe it as dwarf. And if you look at the size, it fits with the lowest range of uh, Homo sapiens variability. So you can say it's a pygmy form, so small form, but not dwarf per se. And that is well known also in the paleogeological uh, data, and John DeVos described that, and Paul Sanda also several times. You have uh, small forms that they call pygmy, and you have dwarf forms. So you have a difference in size. Uh, for Homo luzensis, it's not, uh, it's not uh, dwarf, it's, uh, it's pygmy. For Homo floresiensis, it looks indeed quite dwarf. Um, Second thing, um, I didn't say there is a connection between Homo luzonensis and Homo floresiensis. Actually, if you look at the description of the two, they are totally different. They, have, uh, they are the result of the same kind of processes, although Luzon Island is a much larger island than Flores Island, so not sure exactly the same processes in, were involved. The result looks almost the same, meaning small form with uh, archaic traits, some link them to some link uh, Homo floresiensis to Australopithecines, Australopithecus in Australia. The description of Homo luzensis, they link it to, uh, my, they describe characters that reminds you what you find in Paranthropus, so uh, robust forms of Australopithecus in Africa. But the two are not are not connecting. They explain us the same story, but that's two different events, and one is not the ancestor of the others. The Main question is, nevertheless, do you still have uh, one migration route going from uh, on the eastern side from north to south, and maybe even ending in Flores Island? And then they would have even be part of the same migration. How long was this migration? I don't know. But it doesn't mean that they are related in their small form. Their ancestor might be the same. We should also not forget the time difference because the Flores uh, human is already a million years old, while the Luzonensis is something like what was the latest date? Uh, Luzonensis, it's 70,000. Yeah, so that's a huge time difference. So one cannot be the ancestor of the other, and migration can have taken place several times. 
uh, like Madagascar was colonized. Except if the Kalinga tool makers were also yeah. a small form. Yeah. Okay, just a, just a short second question. You said also that very likely those big mammals were swimming from Asia to the Philippines. And what's about drafting? And what's about the humans? So for the rhinos, the most likely uh, hypothesis is that they, they were swimming. I mean, they have a, a large stomach like all ungulates, so they float very well. They can swim on long distance. Uh, unlike horse, they have three uh, toes, so large paddles, so they, they can swim. I mean, the, the distance between uh, the, the longest distance, largest distance between two of the islands, between Taiwan and uh, Luzon, because you have a, small, uh, a lot of small islands there, it's about 50 kilometers. So, uh, that's doable. We, we know uh, elephants can do that, so why not uh, rhinos, large rhinos? Um, so most likely they arrive while swimming. For humans, uh, that's a huge debate in archaeology. Uh, now archaeologists still believe that, and are still convinced, most of them, I guess, that uh, only Homo sapiens, only our own species, is capable of uh, rafting, I mean, intentionally rafting. So there is a huge debate between archaeology saying whether they, uh, those uh, homo fluorescences and uh, early peopling of the Philippines and also for Sulawesi in between, where we also have old days of colonization, whether they arrived intentionally or accidentally, meaning on floating islands or floating parts of, uh, of lands that would uh, be swift off of the, of the coast. Uh, my own personal opinion is that uh, I see no problem why uh, they cannot go there intentionally. But we have no evidence, and we are far too have any evidence of uh, such intention for the simple reason that they are, these are perishable material you do not find on such old sites. So you can debate forever. It's just an opinion. There's no science behind that. Uh, we, we have stone tools. Okay. Yeah, well, so we know where they were there. How they are right, that we don't know. Yeah, when you showed the the um, the map with the current, I was a bit surprised because uh, is is it a map of the present day? You have the two. Um, if you see well, I'm not sure you do. Uh, you have uh, the present day, so meaning the interglacial condition, and also how the sea currents, based on reconstructions made by the Chinese colleagues from sediments from the, the deep sea, where the sediments are coming from, they know how the sea surface yeah. currents uh, used to act during glacial periods. So you have the two actually, and they and, are the same. And there are no evidence of um, a major current that could uh, justify uh, this? No major difference, no, between the no. two conditions. Okay, and what about island dynamics and uh, the possibility of having other islands or other um, Drifting. Of, of drifting or um, islands that were clo uh, closer in one direction in another. So you do have several islands in between, uh, between Taiwan and, uh, and Luzon, small islands, but uh, between each of these islands you have very deep, uh, uh, deep seas, I mean uh, one kilometer deep. That's a very active area, that's for sure, one of the most active uh, on the planet, on the world. But uh, is very, so it moved a lot, for sure, and we have some difficulties to reconstruct uh, the past uh, geography of this area. But it would be very surprising that there was a, any land bridge, or yeah, any land bridge. What we know is that the Philippines are naturally drifting from the south, at, at least this part of the Philippines. So it was not closer to Taiwan, that's for sure. It's getting closer to Taiwan, and land bridge that's very unlikely. Very, very unlikely. Very, very, very unlikely. Okay. Well, I, I have no hypothesis about that. It was just wondering, looking at this map, I was, I had this kind of question. What, if, what other possibilities could have, uh, could we have? No, well, no, you had, you had to cross the sea. And this happened there. This happened uh, there also, and, and there also for Flores. It happened several times. So we have several evidences that they had to cross the seas, and many seas, actually. OK, thank you. OK, thank you, Thomas. Uh, the next speaker, that will be Louis Valente from Naturalis uh, Biodiversity Center. 
on the extinct birds of New Zealand. Okay, hello everyone. Um, so I'd just like to start by saying that I'm, I'm a bit of an imposter in this uh, symposium because I'm not actually a paleontologist, uh, but I do use a lot of uh, paleontological data in, in my work, so I'll try and uh, show a lot of examples of that. Um, and the, the study I'm going to present uh, is looking at the effects of uh, extinctions caused by humans on islands uh, on the macroevolutionary dynamics on islands. So, yeah, I would like to start by the acknowledgements because I'm going to be mentioning uh, lots of data um, that was produced by paleontologists, archaeologists, also some illustrate, uh, illustrate, um, illustrations um, that I don't have time to thank each one individually, but they are all cited in the papers. Uh, and I also want to thank the um, three co-authors co -author, co of the studies that I'm going to be talking about, uh, Rampal Etienne, who's here, uh, Liliana Davalos and Juan Carlos uh, Garcia. So uh, the questions that we've been particularly interested in addressing are, are these, um, how do anthropogenic extinctions um, affect uh, macroevolutionary dynamics on islands? So for example, how far have humans perturbed the natural environment and how does that affect speciation and um, colonization and extinction dynamics on islands? Um, and the way we can address this is by asking um, how much evolutionary time has actually been lost on an island or how much evolutionary time is um, under threat. So uh, a couple of years ago, um, we developed this uh, metric called the evolutionary return time, uh, which basically asks um, how long would it take for an island to recover back to the diversity that was present um, um, before humans arrived. So uh, on average, how long would that take under natural conditions? Uh, and in these two plots here, you can see um, the kind of uh, simulated trajectories for two different islands. So this is in uh, millions of years. So this is kind of hypothetical trajectories of uh, diversity on two islands. One is at equilibrium, the other one is kind of uh, not at equilibrium. And if you imagine that at the moment that humans arrived, um, diversity was at this blue, line, uh, blue uh, uh, value, but then of course humans arrived and they do what humans do and they uh, lead to the, led to the um, extinction of lots of species, so the diversity goes down back to this uh, red line. So what this evolutionary return time metric is measuring more or less is basically the, the distance, uh, how long it takes to go from the red line back up to the, to the blue line. So from the, the current diversity back to the, the, the original diversity. And we can do, this is kind of showing the past, but actually we can do this into the future and simulate into the future. So um, some aspects about this metric, why we think is quite useful. So it differs from phylogenetic diversity. For a lot of you are probably familiar with phylogenetic diversity, and that measures the kind of the amount of branch lengths that are present on a specific um, region. Um, but this metric differs a bit because it is actually, um, it takes into consideration the different dynamics and aspects uh, of islands. So some islands have, for example, faster rates of colonization um, and they have different climates, so there's, uh, the dynamics might be quite different. Um, and one idea that we have is that we could potentially use this metric to kind of predict the macroevolutionary impact that humans have um, when species go extinct. So we, we could potentially identify islands that are under threat of losing more evolutionary return time, and potentially these islands could then uh, receive um, conservation priority. Uh, of course, this would be one of many uh, aspects for conservation prioritization. Um, so the way this all works, uh, it uses this method that I co-developed with Rampal Etienne and Ali Fillimore a few years ago uh, called DAISY. Uh, it's a dynamic model of island biogeography that uses uh, phylogenetic information from island species to estimate rates of speciation, extinction, and uh, colonization. And from that, uh, we put, put this all into the model and we get these types of plots where we get uh, how the number of species has changed through time on an island kind of on average. Um, and from this, we can then uh, estimate these evolutionary return times. But our, immediately you can see the problem here is that if we're just looking, so this is an example from the Galapagos where we're looking at the, um, the extant species that are alive today. 
but if we want to look at evolution return times, we really need to include uh, the species that have gone uh, extinct um, since humans arrived. And this is where paleontology comes in. And yeah, paleontology um, offers a lot of um, good things for, for the types of studies that, uh, that we're doing. Um, one of the things it is allows us to actually identify which species were present on an island. It seems kind of obvious, but actually this means that you know, a paleontological work needs to be done on every single island separately because each island is its own little universe and things, um, one excavation on an island it cannot uh, tell us much information about other islands. Uh, and another nice uh, important thing is that uh, they allow us to find out when did species actually go extinct on an island. Did they go extinct, for example, when the first um, humans, so when, for example, when Polynesians arrived in the Pacific, did species go extinct then? Or did they go extinct much later when the Europeans arrived? So this is all information that we can get from fossils. Whoops. And another type of information is that, of course, we can then place this, uh, these species into phylogenies. Uh, either using morphology or uh, more recently and increasingly so uh, there's a lot of ancient DNA that's being isolated from um, subfossils. So you'd be surprised how much data there is available now from extinct species quite a lot. So this is just an example of uh, how we use this in the past. Um, so here I'm showing you the times of colonization um, of bats in the Caribbean that we extracted from molecular phylogenies. And you already can see that there's a lot of red all over the place, which is the, the extinct species. And all these extinct species, we could only include them in the phylogenies based on um, paleontological or subfossil archaeological data. Um, and then, um, so what we did for this case, we fitted DAISY to, 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 to this data set to estimate rates of speciation, colonization, and extinction, and to then uh, measure the evolutionary return time. And what we found uh, was that in this particular case, if we wanted to go from the diversity that is present today, so this uh, red line, uh, back to the diversity that was present at the, the point that humans arrived, um, it would take eight million years. So it's a really long uh, time. But in this talk, I want to focus on uh, New Zealand. Uh, this is a new study that we've been doing in the last few years. And this is what um, ap apparently uh, New Zealand um, was looking like, uh, used to look like at the point that um, humans arrived. And New Zealand is um, quite an interesting place and we decided to address these two questions. So the first one, how long would it actually take to recover uh, the diversity, um, back, to the, back to the diversity that was present at the point that humans arrived? and also um, how much evolutionary time would be lost if the species that are currently uh, threatened go extinct. So we wanted to address both things from the past and both uh, hypothetical scenario for, for, for endangered species. And this is um, in press at the moment. So New Zealand is quite interesting for a variety of reasons. It's an ancient, ancient continental fragment. Um, it's been considered a land of birds because um, I think it had no um, native terrestrial uh, birds except from bats. Might be wrong, there might be a few different ones, uh, more recently discovered ones. But it was basically dominated by, by, by birds. And it's, this bird fauna was very diverse. There's, there was lots of colonizations, lots of different radiations. And a very important uh, feature of this fauna was that a lot of these lineages are very evolutionary uh, isolated. So, uh, for example, we have the, the oldest lineages of um, the sister taxa of passerines is found on um, New Zealand. The sister taxa of parrots is found on uh, New Zealand. And so I'm focusing on the terrestrial species uh, of birds of New Zealand. And at the point of human arrival, uh, there were 85 species that we are considering. So of course, then humans arrived. Uh, the first ones to arrive were the Polynesians, which are now the Maori. And they left to a, uh, to a big uh, wave uh, of extinction. Uh, so 30 species of this group of this terrestrial birds were extinct. It's included the, the moa that we all know, heard about. Perhaps some of you have not heard about it, the Hast's eagle, which was an eagle that apparently was hunting moa. But there's also these tiny uh, passerines, uh, stout-legged uh, wren, which went extinct. Some of their relatives are still uh, alive today. And we had geese and other things went extinct. 
And then another wave of extinction happened uh, when the Europeans arrived. Uh, so eight species, additional species went extinct. Uh, some of them very recently, some of them we even have photographs that went extinct in the 20th century. Um, and there's this, for example, this uh, small radiation of the Piopios um, also went extinct after hum uh, Europeans arrived. And the species that do remain, so the ones that survived, uh, a lot of them are, in, are endangered. Uh, so uh, we have 29% of the extant species are threatened uh, with extinction. And if we also include the species that are near threatened, um, we would get, we have that 57% 57, 57 of the native terrestrial birds um, could potentially be threatened um, in the future. And this includes, you know, quite charismatic species like the kiwi, uh, the kakapo, this doctor, giant nocturnal pat, uh, parrot. This is uh, the takahe, the largest member of the, the rail family uh, extant. And this is one of these really uh, ancient, uh, well, um, is one of the group of the sister, sp uh, sister group of passerines, and they're still alive. So what we did uh, is we gathered phylogenetic data for all the terrestrial bird species of uh, New Zealand. Uh, we, this was really a, quite a satisfying thing to do because it's amazing how much data already there was out there. So we were actually able to put together, uh, to compile molecular data on 84% of the species. Uh, including extinct and extant species. And for the extinct species, we were ac actually able to obtain, there was already DNA data available for 77%, so based on ancient uh, DNA studies. Um, so it's really, a, there's been so much studies in New Zealand that it makes it a really e exciting system to study. So, and for the species that we couldn't obtain data, we added them uh, using a, var a variety of kind of missing species assignation me methods. And here I'm showing you the times of colonization with the um, uh, confidence intervals of the different colonization events. The red you can see are the extinct species. You can see all the MOA went extinct. Uh, we also have the threatened species in blue, a bit all over the place, and the near threatened species also a bit all over the place. Um, so what we did is we fitted DAISY to this data set to try and estimate this evolutionary return time. Uh, and we did it uh, at for, for uh, try to address various questions. So the first one, uh, we tried to ask, uh, what is the return time from the diversity that we have today back to the diversity uh, that was present uh, before humans arrived? So we start at this blue line, and if we go uh, for the first one, it, just how long it would take to go back to the diversity that, that was present when Europeans arrived, and that's uh, six million years. But if we want to go back to the diversity uh, that was present at the time of human arrival, we have to go really, really far, and it would take on average uh, 50 million years. If we look at the uh, endangered species, um, if these endangered species go extinct, um, then our diversity will be a bit lower. So we start at this red line, and if we want to go back to the diversity that we have today, um, we would have to wait, uh, it would take on average uh, 6 million years under natural um, dynamics. And then a more extreme uh, scenario, more uh, kind of pessimistic scenario, where also the, the near threatened species go, go extinct. Uh, we start at this red line, which is even lower, and it would take up to 10 million years to return to the diversity that we have uh, today. So these are all quite uh, long times. So just a concluding sl slide. So I think these values on their own, they don't mean much. Okay, 8 million years, 50 million years. I mean, they're clearly very long uh, evolutionary times. Uh, but the whole point now is that we want to do this analysis for several islands and try to see wh whether we can identify certain islands that have uh, high, uh, more evolutionary time under threat, for example. But we do, so the only comparison that we have at the moment is for the bats and the, and the birds, the bats of Caribbean and the birds of New Zealand. So in Caribbean, we had 8 million years, um, but in New Zealand, it's much longer. But this is to be expected because we know that uh, New Zealand is much more evolutionary isolated uh, for a much longer period of time. And we would, get, uh, it would, we would have to wait 10 million years if we wanted to regain the diversity that was uh, present uh, today if species go extinct. Another point is that uh, this really shows that there's a really a deep microevolution impact of humans on islands. So some people say, oh, you know, just leave an island alone and under natural processes it would take maybe, you know, thousands, 10,000 years. But the reality is, is that 
this is really millions of years that are, are needed. So in reality, maybe in, in 50 million years, uh, New Zealand probably wouldn't even be there anymore. So uh, it's quite a, um, a sad story. But on the bright side, I'd say that the conservation decisions that we are taking today, we, um, they really will have implications for millions of years to come. And the nice side of the story is that the conservation efforts in New Zealand are actually quite pioneering and they're really doing a lot of effort. So I think that the species that are threatened in New Zealand at the moment, at least the bird ones, um, are receiving some of the best conservation management plans in the world. So hopefully they won't be lost. Uh, and thank you very much. I'm just going to plug in this uh, advert for a PhD position in my group because I'm looking for a PhD student. So if anyone, uh, if anyone wants or knows of someone looking for a PhD, just come and talk to me. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you for your interdisciplinary talk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any questions? I, I appreciate the take-home message that essentially neither myself nor my species is going to see New Zealand return to, to previous um, uh, evolutionary diversity. But um, looking at those graphs, the, the, the shading indicated, I presume, some type of confidence um, limits, and, and they seem to be quite wide. Like if you take that bottom one there, the 10 million years, it looks like it's got a, a variance from 5 to, to 20 million years there. I, I wonder if you could speak about what, what, um, where's that variation coming from in the model dynamics? Uh, yeah, so this is coming from various factors, but this is, um, so it's actually a stochastic model and there's a lot of uh, variation in there that we, that we obtain from the model. So yeah, we, we, cannot, we cannot get uh, super precise um, ages. So um, yeah, so maybe I should have given like ranges of ages between 20 and, uh, I don't know, 70 million years. Um, but, um, yeah, that's just how the, the, these models work. It's fine. I'm, I'm still not going to see it, am I? <laughs> I'm still not going to see the species come back. By the way, just uh, the, the, so the, the idea is not that the same species will come back, is that, of course, is that the, the diversity uh, will return to um, the original diversity, the number of species. Um. Sorry, over here. Yeah, you may just have asked, answered my question. When you say the amount of time to return to the pre-human di diversity, are you just talking in terms of species richness, or are you talking about phylogenetic spread or whatever? Yeah, uh, just species richness. So we're just measuring how many species were there before humans arrived, and how many species are there today, and how long does it go? Would it take to go from one to the other? regardless of the species that uh, will evolve. Um, I mean, for example, the dodo, of course, will never re-evolve, but you could get potentially actually a species like the dodo, because the dodo is from the pigeon family, so if a, a pigeon, uh, a new pigeon colonizes Mauritius, perhaps it could evolve into a kind of dodo-like um, species, but that's not what we are uh, interested in. It's more the diversity. And of, of course, there's a lot of contingency involved in any fauna in the sense of what came first or what, what, what niches they occupied in order to open up ways or indeed close off ways for subsequent species. Yeah. Yes, and, the, uh, and also, I mean, this kind of assumes um, that almost that you take humans out of the equation um, because we know that humans are going to keep on um, disturbing the habitats further. So. Hi. So, uh, obviously, humans are having a negative impact. What do you think about the idea that humans could also drive faster speciation uh, into the future that would bring down some of these return times? Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, it depends. So, uh, it depend, it's a question of, like, values, right? Do you value uh, the things that were caused by humans? Um, or do you value just the natural processes? Uh, but yeah, I agree, it, it could be, there's the argument that there can be in the future uh, more speciation caused by humans if they, you know, if we're creating more barriers. Um, but then, yeah, is it natural and, yeah, well, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, here, Luis, oh, thank you very much for the, for the presentation. I was, uh, related to this, uh, 
Have you also considered to uh, include the evolutionary potential of the species that were already introduced right now? The, the, the evolutionary potential or the evolutionary rate in of the species that were recently introduced by uh, people? Yeah, that's a good point. So the, we don't we, we exclude introduced species from this um, from from the analysis. So we're just really focusing on the natural processes. So. Um, Assuming that humans are not there, but uh, that's something we could tr we could try and uh, and do. I think we had for one of the reviewers ask for this uh, type of thing, and we it was not me. Discuss. It was not me. It was not. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, it's something that uh, it's. In fact, uh, the number of introduced species that has the number that has, uh, that has been introduced to New Zealand means that the diversity is already in fact higher than it was before humans arrived. So. Um, yeah. uh, Luis, um, you s so you say how, ma how many, the, um, how long it takes to reach the same number of number of species that were there before? But I was wondering if it um, matters uh, from which uh, families or, or whether like the extinctions are ph uh, phylogenetically clustered or widespread. So depending on either the case, it would take longer or less time to reach the equilibrium again? Uh, yeah, that's also a good question. So the, what we are showing here are, is the average across all taxa. So we include like species like the moa that have radiated quite a lot, but also uh, species that have, not radi that have uh, almost no cladogenesis. Uh, so this is an average. If we were to do things, uh, we could also say, oh, we want to treat the moa as something different, and then we would get uh, different uh, values. But we were, all the time we were interested in the average values. But it's maybe something, yeah, if, if we want to start doing this to, to more and more islands, it might be interesting to see. I think that's it. Yeah, I, I have a small question. Uh, did you calculate something like the, the chance of dispersal, the chance of arriving to New Zealand? Yeah, that's included in the model, okay. yeah. yeah. That's a key feature of the model, yeah. Uh, then, if anybody has a question for one of the other speakers, there, there is time now. Everyone has to go. No, nobody has a question for any of the other speakers. Okay, then uh, I close the session. I thank you all for your attention. And I think we have a coffee break, isn't it? Yeah, coffee break. Excuse me, uh, did somebody find a phone in the room? Maybe, okay. Get your phone. Yeah. And That's your fossil. Right. <laughs>